connecting the dots, learning at home with loose parts. Um, loose parts came into my life um, right when I started um, teaching um, right out of school. Uh, much like um, the hopes and dreams of every teacher, we want to go through our program, graduate, and go right into our program. Well, that was actually my case, and I was very, very fortunate to have that be my story. The thing about it was, is, is everything that they taught me in my textbooks, um, when I got into an actual classroom, I don't know if it all just kind of whooshed out of my mind or something might have happened, but I got into a classroom and it was like a brand new experience for me. And so a part of that was how do I get engaging learning materials for my classroom, this pre this preschool classroom that I had just been given um, a classroom of 13 rambunctious three to five year olds. And I had to learn on the spot how to gather materials, lesson plan, and really provide them really um, great learning experiences that were tailored to, the, to what they needed and what their desires were. Um, I also was broke because I just came out of college and had no money, right? And so I had to learn how to gather these materials on a very, very small budget to be able to provide lifelong learning for my students. And I did that through a concept of loose parts and learning in the classroom. And so we're going to take that thought and say, how can we as parents or even as educators encourage our parents to use some of the things that they have right around their house for learning and living with their students, okay? So we're gonna get right into it. My name is Professor Angelica Taylor. Um, I have my master's in early childhood administration um, and I currently teach at Illinois State University as an instructional assistant professor, which also happens to be my alma mater. So it is very special to me to be able to come back to the school that I love so dearly um, and be able to share in my expertise and my learning that I've been able to have throughout these kind of years. Um, sometimes I, it gets intimidating for me because I, ha I have such big shoes to fill because I was in a phenomenal education program, but um, I really enjoy what I do and I enjoy being with my students. I currently teach a clinical classroom, which is probably one of my favorite classrooms because I really get to see my students engage in learning experiences um, with hands-on learning experiences that they get to see, whether it be through um, an actual physical classroom or kind of this method that we're doing now with um, live video with each other. And so when I say I have them always running around their house and gathering materials for learning, we've always been kind of this engaging group. And so it's been really great to take um, what they would have learned in the classroom and kind of tailor it to what we see now. So that's a little bit about me, but also super boring. We're gonna keep moving forward, right? We're gonna keep getting into it. So some of the objectives we're gonna talk about today is we're gonna define what loose parts are. We're gonna learn a little bit about the history and the background, but identify the importance, and then it'll be your turn to put it into practice in the home. We're gonna collaborate a little bit, and then we're gonna review. Does that sound good? So this is the part where, my, where I go to my students and I say, okay, you guys didn't fall asleep on me, right? Can you give me an emoji? Give me a thumbs up, give me a clap. We're all still here. Give me a smile, a whoop whoop. All right, perfect. Oh, I even got a celebration from Caitlin. I've never gotten one of those before. Oh man, I feel, I feel really good about that. <laughs> I got a heart, oh, you guys are already making me feel this is gonna be really good for us. Okay, <laughs> so before we get started, I just kind of want to know who's in the room. So that's where we're going to go ahead and go into that chat and take the doodle, um, take the um, poll everywhere to see who's in the classroom. Do I have students? Do I have educators? Do I have um, practitioners? Who's in the room with us? So I have students. I have a couple of teachers. Any paraprofessionals or teacher assistants, anybody, um, providers, therapists, or administrators, principals in a room. Um, my mom is in the room. I do see her name. Hi, mom. <laughs> All right. So we have basically students and teachers, mostly students and teachers in here. 
Um, and so we're really going to feed off of each other. Um, the students, you guys are going to learn from the teachers how we use these loose parts in the classroom. And then students, you guys are also going to share with us and tell us what do you want to know more about how to embed this into your classroom and what you can use in the future once you have your own classroom and how to kind of start um, building this um, um, recycled material that we're going to talk about today. Okay. Okay, so thank you guys for engaging with me on that. Okay, so what are we starting with? The thing that makes loose parts and learning about loose parts so special is because it really does and take the embedding of natural materials um, and then using them for learning, right? So we're you really using the world around us to be able to provide learning experiences for our students. Thomas Berry says, teaching children about the natural world should be seen as one of the most important events in their lives. And it's because we use these things and we use these materials that we can get from natural resources around us and we use them to create lifelong learning experiences for students, right? So we know that learning does not end when they leave our classroom and learning does not end when they leave out of um, you know, elementary school or even high school or even college. We're all continually learning, even as teachers, even as educators, and even as moving forward into um, this journey through education that we've all made the choice to be on. It never ends. And so if we use the things around us to give our students a foundation of learning, they will always be able to use those materials as a reference to go back into their different learning experiences that they will have over time. And so that quote really sticks out to me because it really drives home the fact that the world around us is already our classroom. Uh, my students know it as I call the world around us our third classroom or the classroom is our third classroom because there's us as the teachers, there's the students who are also teachers, and then it's the resources that we have around us that we also use for learning experiences. So loose parts and learning. Loose parts are any object, material, anything that can be moved, manipulated, controlled, or changed while children are at play. Play is the way that children learn best in a classroom, especially when you think of the early ages of six weeks to um, five years of age. Being able to manipulate their objects, the world around them, their materials is the best way for them to get a solid foundation of what they're learning and grasping several different concepts. Loose parts provides an endless way for children to carry, combine, redesign, build up, take down, put it apart, put it back together, see how it works, change it, um, and really manipulate the object to best be able to learn for themselves. So we really like the idea of loose parts because it almost gives the child the control that they need to be able to learn a concept. And we're gonna look at some hands-on learning experiences that I've created with some loose parts that I found around my house a little bit later. So we think of that idea of the endless ways that children can take these different objects and learn with them. The history of loose parts comes from Simon Nicholson. He was a British architect with, if you look at any kind of loose parts, it will make sense that um, construction or architecture has something to do with it because it's using Sticks, a lot of sticks, a lot of trees, a lot of building, a lot of natural wood materials to create these learning experiences. Um, but he believed that people of all ages had the idea to be creative. So even from our youngest of infants to our oldest of adults, anybody has the opportunity to be able to create and be creative in their own learning space. He believed that again, the environment around us offered endless learning opportunities for, be, for us to grow within our development. So he coined the phrase loose parts as a way to describe what open-ended materials um, can be manipulated in many ways. Not my students, because I know you all know, but who can tell me in the chat box, what is your definition of open-ended materials or what are your thoughts on open-ended materials in a classroom? 
anything can be, so Stacy said, anything can be an open-ended material, um, anything that's reusable, anything, anything can be, um, they don't have one set, one set doesn't have to be used, anything with construction and design, absolutely. Um, anything that creates opportunities for dialogue, 100%. Um, any material that can be used in lots of different ways, items for ver for a variety of purposes, you guys got it, okay, right? We don't need me, right? You guys understand, what are these open-ended materials? What are these ways that we can engage with students without giving them, um, kind of feeding them what we want them to learn? Um, so we have open-ended materials are like open-ended questions in that they can be used to expand learning in many ways. Um, Outside materials that can be used for the mind to decide. Oh, I really love that one. Outside materials that can be used for the mind to decide. Janice, oh, thank Angelica, you. you know that she's in my class, so. <laughs> in my class too, thank you so very much. Oh, snap, oh, snap. <laughs> thank you so very much. Um, so Shanice, excellent quote, right? The mind gets to decide how we are going to use the materials that are in front of us, right? So it's not, um, what, do, what do I always say in my classroom um, for my students that are in here? So it's not week of the letter, letter week for us, right? It's not just today, we, this week we are going to learn the letter A and then we're gonna do Ethel and airplane. And then we're going to take our little, um, airplane pieces and you'll put the wing through the, um, the staff and then we'll fly it and then that's an airplane. No, it's taking the pieces out and you say, build me an airplane or taking some materials out and say, can you show me what an airplane looks like? And letting the student decide from what they know in their mind, what an airplane actually looks like based off references from what they know. So a student can say, well, there's an airport that lives right that I live right next to an airport and the planes always go right? So they may not have used the materials that were actually given to us, but we do know that they have an understanding of what an airplane is because they can tell us that. Or they may, they may take two pieces of paper and they might twist it together and they say, this is my airplane, right? So they're showing us from their own mind how we can decide what this material is. So thank you so much for that. You guys are spot on. So I might have to come in and out of the screens and onto the screen because sometimes it won't let me see the chat when I'm presenting. Um, so we'll kind of see where that is from there. Let me see if I, okay, now I got it in there. So Brandon says it reminds him of a TED talk about the anger of a single story. Why limit a child's mind to, or the danger of a single story? Why limit a child's mind to what a material is? Absolutely, right? And we see that a lot of children when they go, um, when they take two minutes to tell us a story, right? And it's always, cause, um, and, and we were going to the store and um, um, going up in the, it, right? It's because they probably have many stories going on and they're trying to focus on that one to tell us before they tell us another and another and another. I always tell people some of the best conversations I ever had was with my three to five year old students. They just would just talk and it seemed they had like a greater understanding of the world around them that I even had as an adult or as their teacher. A lot of times I would be doing something and they would say, well, Miss Angelica, just do it this way. And I would be like, you know, you're right. That is how we should have done that in the first place, right? So really letting them use and expand their minds and the loose parts is a great way to build on that. Oh good, this gives me like a little timer down here, perfect. So because of that, we know that with loose parts, there's infinite play possibilities and kind of what we've already been talking about. So there's multiple ways to achieve one learning objective. So we have materials out and in that one um, group of materials, we could either be doing math object objectives, we could be doing language, language arts, arts objectives, we could be doing science objectives with just the same materials because they have no limit in what they can be doing in their play. They invite conversation and interaction. So like you all were saying, 
keeping it open-ended expands their own mind to be able to say, this is what this is thinking about me it, or for, the, for um, this particular play. And then we just come in and facilitate and expand upon that. They start the conversation and we just let it go until they're done with that and wanna move on to the next thing. Um, it encourages collaboration. So we talk about being able to work together in groups or work together with other children or students at home. Parents, this is gonna be really important for you because at home, you all want to be engaged in what your child is learning. Loose Parts is a wonderful way to do that because it literally encourages you all and invites you to collaborate in your child's learning in an organic way. So we're not just sitting with them, right? They are already having to be on a computer for hours and hours at a time. And then when they shut the computer off, we as the parent comes in and say, now we're gonna sit and do this worksheet for however long as well. Nine times out of 10, they're not listening to us anymore, right? They're not engaging with us versus taking some of these more ways that we can have hands-on experience with them and encourage them to collaborate with us in their own learning experience. It pre promotes creativity and innovation, just like I said, we were talking about before. You never know what a child's mind is processing when we give them these materials. We could be thinking that they're going to build one thing and they say, no, it's X, Y, Z, right? And then you never think that that is also what this um, material could have been used as. Loose Parts gives them the independency to be able to create on their own. And it also creates social competency for skills of lifelong learning. And lifelong learning is something that I really impress upon not only my students, but anybody who I engage with. Because again, we talk about the things we learn in our foundation is what we take with us all the way through to our learning. So any questions on that? All right. So it says eight minutes remaining, but we just got in here. So I'm gonna see what that might be about. So we're gonna take a look about puzzles versus loose, um, loose parts. Um, and thinking about that open-ended material, when we look at this puzzle, what, do we, what does this puzzle kind of say to us when it thinks about open-ended material? Feel free to share or come on with us. Puzzles have a fixed outcome. Mm -hmm. There is a right answer. Yes, I like that. Every piece has a place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, puzzles have an end goal. Right, so we're looking at this puzzle and it says there's only one way to do that. As Lauren came on and says, or um, Dr. Taylor says, there's only one way that makes the puzzle correct. So does that give us an expanded thinking or does that limit our thinking? What do we think? It's a limited way of thinking, right? Yeah, it's limited thinking. It says all the pieces have a place and if you don't put the piece in the correct place, then it's wrong. Versus saying, looking at loose parts or something within loose parts that says, here are the materials and you are able to take this, this now um, um, thought and you can create in many different ways. There are zigzags, there are swirls, there is a cross, there is a triangle. Also, you don't have to use any of these lines if you don't want to, because there's also free space for you to create what you want to have also that's coming into your mind. Going back to that, it's an open-minded activity, right? So even though I've given you some guidance with the different kinds of puzzles or pieces or collaborations, you also have free space within here to create how you want to. For parents, if you guys have a, um, play table or a table that you're not using. This is a great activity to engage with your child with because you put you can put a piece of paper over that table. If you have butcher paper, you can get a poster board from 
the dollar store, and you can make these lines and get just some materials around the house, this is a great way to just play and engage with them. But we also see that we can get some standards out of it, right? Because we have the cross bridge here. I'll throw my pointer up here. We have this here where we can put numbers in it, right? So we have one, two, three. And then we say, can you put one in here, two in here, three in here? What colors do you want to hear have on, on your dots? Oh, I see that you use squiggly lines. What are those mean to you? Oh, you're you're swimming in the ocean? How exciting. Tell me more about that. When did you learn how to swim? How did you learn how to swim? Does the water scare you? Are there sharks or fish in your water? Now we're expanding on that thinking and we're taking it a little further than what our just puzzle piece are. But do we take the puzzle piece out of the classroom or take the puzzles out of the classroom? Absolutely not. We're giving both options so children can have a um, variety of ways to expand that thinking. Okay, so um, loose parts and play. So we want to be able to bring this together because a lot of times um, coming into the world of early childhood and we think of the thoughts of play, we have a lot of parents say, well, I don't want my child going to school and playing. Why are they playing? And then what do we say, students? What do we say play is? What have we been learning about? What have you guys know? What are your thoughts about play? Or what have you guys been learning about play in your classes? I know a lot of you guys have me. Some of you guys have my colleagues. What are your thoughts on play? Play is child's work. Play is the work of children. Yay, this semester has been going well. <laughs> Play is meaningful. Children learn best when they are playing. Play is inquiry-based learning. Yeah, so this is how they learn. Play is serious, right? Play is serious for a child. It's not just coming to um, a classroom and we just take out these materials and we run around all day and then we take them back home and say, okay, Timmy, see you the next day, see you tomorrow. No. Play is never a waste of time, Stacy. I love that, that statement, right? Shanice says, play-based learning is the best route to take for children to develop emotional and social, and social skills. Absolutely. This is the way that they learn. And we just take that and we expand upon it as their teachers or as their providers or as their parents. So children thrive in a playful environment when their imagination can run wild. I love that, Brandon. Absolutely. They learn best. They thrive. They almost survive in this world that we live in right now when they're playing, right? And I almost gander to say, we as teachers learn best through this kind of play that they um, engage in. We kind of lose that over time when we have to be um, much more in a parochial school where we have to do the worksheets and things like that. But I encourage you guys that as you guys grow through your learning or even parents as you guys are showing um, and helping your, or your students, really engaging in that play with them and taking them back to the base of what they're learning. So we have Brandon who says, educators learn technology best when they are playing with the tech. Absolutely, right? So we get a new phone and what do we do? We just... We, I, don't, I don't remember the last time I read an instruction manual. I just get on there and I just start doing things, right? And we just see, hopefully it works, hopefully it doesn't work, correct? So we'll see what this loose parts are and how we can use that in the classroom. I'm trying to erase this annotate. Let's see, there we go. Perfect. And it also supports curriculum. So for our parents in here, for those of you all who are wondering, does loose parts support curriculum? It absolutely does. And it actually touches on math, science, language literacy, and art. I'm gonna show you guys a little bit about that in a minute, and then we're gonna engage in that um, together. So what do we say? We assist math for, um, loose parts assist with math and Oh, okay. Um, children um, assist with math, children, language literacy, and art. And it's telling us we have about 10 more minutes. So we're going to keep moving forward, okay? Any questions on this before we um, move forward, okay? Any? 
Okay. So let's get into it. So now we're going to talk a little bit about loose parts and we're going to talk about loose parts in um, the home environment. So right about now would have been the time where I would have you guys go and grab an item um, in your home, something that's really close to you. I want you to grab it. I just want you to bring, bring it right back to you. If we have time, we're going to get to it. But now we're going to look a little bit about loose parts and we're going to talk about how we can use loose parts in the home. So grab your item, take a minute, grab your item. Think about an open-ended learning um, item that you might have in your home, something within reach. Go grab it, yep, go grab it. I can, Stacy. I can share this PowerPoint with you. If they don't kick us out, if not, um, give me an email and I can email it to you, okay. So we're going to take a little bit and while you guys go, while I go on to the next item, show me um, in the chat box, tell me, um, you know what, Stacy? Yes, <laughs> toilet paper rolls are our, our, our best friends. Um, go ahead and tell me what you guys have um, you, that you grabbed, which loose part item did you grab? So we have, anybody have rocks? Jars of pennies, coffee cans, trays, cookie sheeters, paper clips, hammers. Oh, you guys did really good on this one. <laughs> what else do we have? Noodles. I got you, Stacey. There are your toilet paper rolls. And of course, our solo cups. <laughs> So I'm going to take a minute now and we're going to just take a look at some of the loose part items that I created. Can you all see that? On my table. Let's see. Maybe if I put it here. That better? Give me a thumbs up if that looks better for you all. Okay. So welcome to my loose parts table, right? Here we have um, a ton of loose part items that I have presented to you guys. And we're gonna talk about how we're gonna use them um, in the home. So the first thing that I have here are our handy dandy toilet paper rolls. I know you all have them because we had to toilet paper gate at the um, beginning of this year where um, everyone needed toilet paper so there were none in the stores. Well, I've collected mine and on here, I've just made it so that I've put all of um, letters, I've put random letters on each of these toilet papers. So how do we promote literacy with this? So we say um, one of your students comes home and they have a, um, a spelling list that they have to get to. We take these toilet paper rolls and we put them in random order and we say, grab me the letters for um, let's see, what letter can we do here? So I have B, A, and D. So show me how to spell B, bad. B, A, D. Awesome, and then we take them, we put them back in random order again. So give me another three or four letter word. We got cups. So another one we could do, right? So we have what? We have one on here. So we have our other letters that we can do here. So we have um, our M and we have A. So we have Ma, right? So then we can take these here, or we can even do may, right? If we're learning names. So we have all of these random ways to be able to engage with our students other than just saying, okay, now spell this letter or spell this letter with us. 
we now have a way to engage with them by taking these toilet paper rolls, putting letters on them and going through their spelling list. Now they have a tangible way of being able to learn with their students, okay? The other one that we have here, and this is actually my potpourri basket that I use. And I grabbed four different size things here. And we say to them, can you put them in order for us? And they go, this is the small one. This is the next one. This is the middle one. And this is the big one. So now we've gotten that linear or that math in place where we're doing smallest to biggest, or we're doing, we can do which one is heavier, which one is lighter, which one weighs more. Now we're putting tangible thought into what our students are learning. So now it's gonna be your turn and hopefully we get to some of these. So I see you guys already started grabbing your um, items. Does somebody want to share or take five minutes to think about what is um, what the item is that you have and how you can create it to be a loose part, um, um, a learning experience in the home? Yes, Brandon, I like that. So Give students about seven to eight cups with different letters and see how many different words they can make. Absolutely. Um, yes, yes, we love a good middle school math class. Yes, I also have my cups here, but we're short on time. So while you guys are thinking, Choose a mixer, and I suppose we can do recipe doubling in half. Yep, take a hammer and see what makes loud and soft noises. Absolutely. Or we can take our cups here, and we say we give them the number three and see if they can take the cups and build one, two, three. No, we can't, right? Three. Or then we say, can you put on four? Give them four cups and say, can you stack four cups and see if they can do one, two, three, and four. So now we have four. And then we tell them, take it, and we continually add on the numbers in which they're going to be learning so that they can build on top of each other. They can also group them. They can also put them in place. How many can you stack up high before it falls down, right? So now we're putting these together. So we have any grouping items. How many ways can you make 10? Absolutely. I have these sticks here. And with our sticks, I also have um, these clothespins. How many ways can you make 10? One, two, three, so on and so forth. And then you can also take them off here and then add one on and say we put five on one and five on the other. That is then is 10, right? Or if we, however many we put on, if we have five sticks, how many clothespins goes on five sticks to make 10? Now you have two on each, that also makes 10. So those are different ways that we can be using um, how can you build to hold a soup can? Absolutely. You can even take these and you can stick them through the cups, right? And say, how many holes can you make to put something through where it will hold, right? So now we're taking these thoughts and expanding them. We're talking about engineering. We're talking about building. We're talking about placement. We're talking about math. We're continually growing and expanding on their thought. Great job, everybody. Any other thoughts? before we go ahead and wrap up. Okay. So we did went ahead and took our time to share and thank you guys for all of your ideas. And yes, this PowerPoint will be available to you all. If you do want to have it, I can send it to you all in an email. If you just wanna put that in the chat box, I'll write it down and send it to you. 
Um, so these are some of the ways that I have used loose parts in my classroom before um, and some things you guys can do at home. Um, this was a um, art provocation that my students did of Starry Night from Vincent Van Gogh. And I got all of these materials from a garage sale that I was at. And it's golden rings, um, blue and clear gems, some yellow ribbon and some blue ribbon. And the students were able to take their thought about the picture and put it on the um, black canvas. And that was their way of creating their own starry night. So I never said to them, well, the sun goes up here and the black um, building goes over here and the swirls go here. They were able to kind of create that on their own and make what they thought the, of the picture. Also Christmas lights, because in my world, Christmas is year round. <laughs> Hey, just a heads up, uh, about two to three minutes. Okay, yep, we're wrapping up. All right, thanks. Thank you. For this one, we did a dinosaur egg hatch um, and I had black beans, some black rock, um, black rocks, some moss that I had found um, again in an art supply closet. And um, I used um, baking soda or baking powder and water to put dinosaurs inside of them. And then they had to use, um, they had to use peroxide to make it boil or bubble rather. And um, they had to hatch the dinosaur from the dinosaur egg. So again, I just placed it out there and I said, find the dinosaur or birth the dinosaur. And then they took that on themselves to figure out how to use the pipe, the um, pipettes to be able to do that. So as we wrap up, there's so much value in loose parts and I kind of hope that's been the quick version of how we kind of drive this home. Generally, I take a longer time to go through this, um, but um, I'm just so glad that you guys were able to join in with me for a little bit on this particular way of learning about loose parts. Um, we, it allows the children to, um, the ability to be in control of their own learning it challenges children to um, achieve mastery of an object. Um, it gives the children the ability to create their own stories and it's free. You get to use the items over and over and over again at no cost to you. And that is probably one of the best parts of Loose Parts if you ask me. <laughs> so thank you all for joining me and thank you guys for taking this journey with me. Um, yes, um, thank you for um, taking this journey of loose parts with me. Some of the resources that I um, always have in my back pocket is Loose Parts Inspiring Play in, when, in Young Children. That book is absolutely phenomenal. It will save you. Um, what I always say, when you, when you read it the first time, it's purely just to watch the pictures because they're so wonderful and so engaging. And then you go back again and then you actually read it for the material. Um, and then also communityplaythings.com is a wonderful resource um, for you to be able to use with um, just learning about different things that are going on in early childhood. Um, in different ways that we can do. Um, yes, this is why we are quarters. I do ever so often, you know, give, give to the community, but I struggle with throwing things away too, Stacey. So, uh, but all for good learning experiences. So thank you all so much for joining me. It was a pleasure having all of you. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Dornfeld, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, for joining us. Um, Dr. Dornfeld is a mentor of mine and my mom, um, Dr. Antoinette Taylor is on with us as well. So thank you both for your support and for coming. Thank you to all of my students who guys are on here. You guys are the bomb. You guys gave great answers and really affirmed that we are making it through these 14 weeks together. Um, for all of the teachers who are on here, you guys are superstars and honestly, um, I've been in your shoes. I'm still in your shoes. And I, we are, we're, we are superheroes. We are the superheroes. Um, so never, ever forget that. Um, for our paraprofessionals who are on, we could not do our jobs without you. Um, so thank you for all that you do. This world of education is so very rewarding. No matter the tireless nights, no matter the, um, the stress and the angst and the wanting to do the best we can by our children. It really is the heart of the job that makes it so very worth it. So give yourselves a hand clap, give yourselves a round of applause and a pat on the back. And we will talk to you all later. If you are interested 
in being able to have this PowerPoint, please let me know in the chat box and I'll write it down and send it over to you. All right, thank you, bye.